thing, I'm just going to uh, introduce the person who's actually going to host you for this evening, moderate the discussion, and um, uh, kind of guide the flow. And uh, she is also the, the brain behind this operation. So this entire series was really her, her doing and her thinking. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Amal Alashkar, who is going to uh, moderate this evening. Amal. Thank you very much, Mike. Good evening. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining us in the third panel of our UCI Brain Dialogue series. So today we discuss collective memory, a topic that touches every one of us in our search for self and group identities. Collective memory is a complex social process in which a social group constructs and reproduces its relation to the past. Our topic is also timely in time of Corona pandemic with an unprecedented level of collective experience which scales up to generate maybe global collective memory. Yet the question is whether the same historical event or crisis can shape our memory uniformly or differently in different social groups. What are the components of collective memory? What are the mechanisms of construction, reconstruction, and transgenerational transmission of collective memory? What is the significance of language, beliefs, and art in forming our collective memory? And what is the role that collective memory plays in shaping self and collective identity? Tonight, we are fortunate to have an impressive group of panelists who consider these and other questions in their research. So let me introduce our speakers in the alphabetical order. So Dr. Margaret Gilbert is a distinguished professor in philosophy in School of Humanities at UCI. All our speakers are our UCI professors. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, is a member in the American Academy of Arts and Science, and her research focuses on social, political, and moral philosophy and philosophy of law. She also addresses collective emotions, collective responsibility, and personal decisions and intentions. Dr. Erika Hayasaki is an associate professor in literary journalism program at UCI, and she is a journalist who writes about health, science, technology, psychology, and the human condition. Her research interests include health and science narratives, medical journalism, race and culture reporting, audio and multimedia storytelling. Dr. Judy Kroll is distinguished professor in the Department of Language Science, she is co-founder of Women in Cognitive Science, and her research concerns the cognitive processes underlying bilingualism. She discovered that when one language is spoken, both languages are active. Three weeks ago, she was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science. So congratulations, Judy. I want to make it public. And lastly, Dr. Mark uh, Levine. Mark is a professor of history and his research focuses on Middle East history with a special focus on cultures and religions of the modern Middle East, globalization, the role of music and in uh, political struggles and cultural jamming. His scholarship activism and muse music are all tied to his commitment to struggles for social justice in the United States and around the world. As always, our conversation will have three parts. So in the first part, our panelists will talk about their research and work as they relate to the topic to collective memory. And in the second part, we will kick off the conversation asking questions so our speakers dive in depth in their discussions. And in the third part, we will open up the floor to give our audience an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. So 
Without any further delay, I would like to invite our first speaker to start. So, Margaret, do you want to start? Sure. Being, being alphabetically the first, I think that's fair. Um, so, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Let me first say that I am a philosopher with a focus on the social world. I was asked to speak tonight on collective belief, collective memory, or both. Now, I've previously developed an account of collective belief, which I've been developing over many years, but not of collective memory. In this short talk, I'll first outline my account of collective belief. I'll then consider an account of collective memory along the same lines. And that's rather a new venture for me, so I'll be excited to discuss it uh, with people afterwards. So starting with collective belief, my target is something like this, to understand what people mean when they say such things as, we believe we'll win the game. And they don't just mean each of us believes, or we all believe. Evidently, they're attributing a belief to us, considered as a single subject of belief, a single plural believer. My account of collective belief uses some technical terms. I'll first present it and then I'll explain it. So my account is for two or more people collectively to believe that such and such is for them to be jointly committed to believe that such and such as a body. <clears throat> so that's a brief, a brief statement. So spelling that out a bit, uh, for two or more people collectively to believe that such and such is for them to be jointly committed to emulate by virtue of the utterances and actions of each a single entity that believes that such and such. So in brief, everyone is to talk the talk in relevant circumstances. The key technical term here is jointly committed for and for two or more people to be jointly committed is roughly for them to be committed as one. The process of joint commitment, which is something that people engage in and, and create, they create their joint commitments, may be tacit. It may not involve words. What is needed is roughly that each party's readiness to be party to the joint commitment must have been openly expressed to, to the other or others. Now, I take an everyday agreement to be just one explicit way of creating a joint commitment. As is the case with an agreement, no one party can rescind a joint commitment unilaterally. Each party must be on board. Now, importantly, when people are jointly committed in some way, just as when they're agreed, when they've made an agreement, they are obligated to each other to conform to the commitment. They have correlative rights to such conformity and equivalently have the standing to demand conformity of one another and to rebuke one another for non-conformity. Now, you know, I've gone through this all very quickly just to have it out there. Um, let me wrap up this section by analyzing a simple interchange in terms of collective belief as I've just explained it. Jack says, terrible air quality, today, in California, Jill replies, yes, indeed. They now, I would say, collectively believe that the air quality today is terrible. Crucially, each has expressed his or her readiness jointly to commit with the other to believing as a body that the air quality is, today is terrible. At least as far as this conversation goes, they're now obligated to one another to talk the talk as to the air being terrible today. Note, this is important, that to say what I've just said is not to say that either of them personally believes the air quality is terrible today, nor it seems need either of them do so. In their initial encounter, Jack could have been testing Jill to see if she would go along with anything he said, knowing her compliant personality. And Jill may have taken the bait, though neither of them personally believed that the air quality was terrible. Nonetheless, I propose that either could now properly say, we think the air quality is terrible today, 
using what we may call the collective we. On this account then, we may collectively believe something though none of us personally believes it. We may of course personally believe it, but the idea is that that's not essential. We are nonetheless obligated to one another to talk the talk expressive of our collective belief. Let me turn now to collective memory. Those who have discussed memory in the individual human case distinguish between semantic or propositional memory, such as I display when I remember that Paris is the capital of France, and episodic memory, memory of some happening, such as when I remember meeting a certain person. Do either of these kinds of individual memory have a belief component? That's one question. If either of them does, then one would expect a collective belief to be a component of the corresponding collective memory, assuming that there are such things as collective memories. <clears throat> the relation of individual memory and belief, however, turns out to be a contentious one, as various philosophers have argued. Luckily, there's a plausible account of collective memory, or at least I'll suggest it's plausible, that leaves that op question open. I have in mind a joint commitment account along the lines of the joint commitment account of collective belief. Now, it so happens, and when I was thinking about this for this evening's, um, this evening's meeting, I was thinking that um, this might be the way to go. And I discovered that an account of this type was recently proposed by Jeffrey Bluestein uh, in an article drawing on my work, uh, which was published in 2019 in Memory Studies. Slightly rephrasing his formulation and incorporating both kinds of memory mentioned earlier, this account runs as follows. For two or more people collectively to remember that P or collectively to remember that, or sorry, or collectively to remember event E is for them to be jointly committed to remember as a body that P or event E. Lustin gives an example that accords nicely with this account, the example of the members of a book club trying together to recall their previous discussion. As he puts it, the members' fragmentary memories of the last meeting are pooled in a process of collaborative group recall, creating a group memory that they can at least provisionally agree upon. So that's like a, a an illustration, I think, of what I'm talking about. Now, you know, I've only been given five to 10 minutes to do this, so, so I'll move to the end. Some implications of the joint commitment account of collective memory. Given that account, our, our having a particular collective memory has a number of practical implications for each of us going forward. In particular, a party to the relevant joint commitment who bluntly denied that a collectively remembered event ever happened, would be liable to attract demands for an explanation or outright rebukes from the other parties. And these will be demands and rebukes made with the standing to do so. Thus, once established, collective memories are likely to be relatively stable, collective memories on this account, and to resist contestation whether they're voracious or not. In short, they will be social forces to be reckoned with and therefore worth taking into account by those who are considering social relations and social change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, for such wonderful presentation. Uh, we will move now to Erika, who will speak about her research as it relates to collective memory. Erika? Let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, hopefully you can all see this. Um, thanks for having me. So I'm a journalist and I teach in the literary journalism program at UC Irvine. And I think a lot about memory um, as a journalist, as somebody who's relied on other people's memories to tell stories and relied on archives, for example, to tell stories. Um, I think of 
um, collective memory as a community's shared renderings of the past, which helps shape its collective identity. Um, not a solid record of the past. Um, we know from science that memory is reconstructive, the reconstructive process, it involves encoding and storage and retrieval. And that also involves distortions and false details and inaccuracies. And this process can be affected by the outside world. And that includes everything from leading questioning to the questioning of journalists, to the questioning of police, for example, to the presence of other people. And I also know that, you know, reporter stories have often been referred to as the first drafts of history. So I think about literary journalism's role and journalism as a whole, its role in collective memory. Um, literary journalism, for those of you who aren't familiar, in comparison to daily journalism, is a form that, you know, is long form. It allows for more time, story research, in-depth interviews, archives, narrative development, and craft. And literary journalists also imbue their own inquiries and stories with their own constellation of experiences and values and intelligence and philosophical questions to, into their stories. And journalism, like science, exists within a paradigm based on subconscious beliefs, which, is, which are embedded within systems that are influenced by a particular social and political moment in time. And so I was happy to see Elizabeth Loftus in the audience because her work has inspired a lot of the way I think about journalism and reporting. And I was able to take some classes, audit some classes with her. And one of the earlier stories that I wrote for The Atlantic around um, false memories, uh, I was initially thinking about, you know, my time as a newspaper reporter, when I would have to rush to the scene after, you know, a terrorist attack or <laughs> to obtain quotes from a train crash or a mass shooting or a plane crash. And it really made sense to me that the people I spoke to would have intimately remembered um, shocking uh, emotionally, they would remember the details of these emotionally charged events. And, you know, that's known as flashbulb memory. But, you know, I came to understand that these memories can also be unreliable. You know, there's a study um, of eyewitnesses to a plane crash in which um, people who are witnesses were interviewed by a reporter and they had differing collection, recollections of this plane crash um, and even compared to you know, photographs of the plane crash as well. And then in thinking about eyewitness testimonies, and this is a piece that I wrote um, uh, looking at a case in which a woman um, actually, you know, witnessed her husband um, killed in front of her in 1991. And the scene is, you know, it opens up in her memory. It opens up in what, with what she remembers. And she saw this man kill her husband and she caught a glimpse of his face. Um, and then, you know, time passed. Uh, 10 years passed, the case went cold, they didn't find the suspect. And then one day she sees a photograph of somebody in the newspaper and she is certain that this is the man who, who murdered her husband. And the question around that case really became, you know, can you remember 10 years later um, in a traumatic moment like that in the rain? Um, can you remember with such certainty that this is the person who murdered her husband? Um, so when it comes to long-term recollections, most memory researchers believe that modifications are constantly being made and gaps in narrative are filled in with experiences and expectations, but not always the actual events. And even in stressful situations, this can be really challenging for memory, um, can lead to false identification and um, mis mistaken identification. We also know that there's selective exposure. We have a ten tendency to seek information that reinforces our pre-existing beliefs and also to avoid information that brings those beliefs into question. Memory itself is a storyteller, I think of it that way. Memories are shaped by our beliefs and can function to maintain um, a consistent narrative rather than an accurate record. And so this is relevant when we think about collective memory. So as journalists, as storytellers, um, we have to ask ourselves who is telling the story. Uh, journalists are susceptible to other people's false memories. We're also susceptible to our own false memories. Uh, journalists must also consider the source. Who are you getting your story from? If you're relying on archives or documents, whose stories have been preserved and by whom? And this is important, I think, as we document history right now. Um, you know, these reports become a part of collective memory, which is reinforced by the press. And individual memory can play a role in making up collective memory. And so this is a story, just real quick, um, this is a story that ran in 2018. Uh, sorry about my kids in the background. This is a, the crazy hour at, at my house. Um, 
So sus the, the, you might recognize this, this was in the local news, suspect who struggled with Anaheim police officers dies in hospital. And this is the picture of Christopher Isinger, a young man who um, uh, died after uh, this encounter with police in the article, you know, it, it refers to him as a homeless man, a transient man. He fit the description of breaking into homes and cars. The police reported that he had a metal pipe, a weapon. He resists police, loses consciousness. The coroner determines cause of death is a meth, is meth in the system and a bad heart. Um, the DA rules officers are not at fault. No charges are pressed. Um, this photo is provided to the police by, uh, I'm sorry, to the press by the police. And, you know, you could think that story, the story could really end there, right? If, it, if the case doesn't go on, this is the story that ends up in the press and it could end up with these details becoming part of this society, you know, this community's collective memory of this case. Our brains are wired to assume things we believe originated from a, credi a credible source. And certainly you might consider, you know, your local news when it's sourced out to be a credible source. Um, but I followed this case, I'm writing about this case, um, and you know, this case was actually taking place during the uh, Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, the family um, actually sued the city of Anaheim and won $2.3 million. This is a photograph that was provided by the family to the press. Um, and if you watch the camera videos, you'll see that you know, there were five officers on his back when he went unconscious under the weight of officers, he loses a pulse. No officer tries to resuscitate, he's brain dead. There is no metal pipe. Um, there is no weapon found. Um, other experts testify that he died of a lack of oxygen as a result of police restraint. Um, there were questions around the police being in the autopsy room. And so it's a very different account when you, sh you know, present more information, shift the point of view. Um, but a lot of stories never get this far because they don't always get to this far in court, frankly. Um, this is Joan Didion, and I just wanted to add this in there because it's important for us to think about what details are left out, what background is left out, what if the story does not fit neatly within the confines of a traditional narrative structure. There's story forms that the brain wants. We want beginnings and middles and ends. Resolutions, we want to wrap it up on a hopeful note, some kind of triumph, resilience, lessons learned. This is what we learn as storytellers. If you go to a movie, and you're not happy with the ending, you feel like you waste your time, you wasted your time. Um, as writers, we also seek out stories with heroes and redemption arcs and happy endings. Um, psychologists call this, you know, script theory, a specific life event amplified by strong effects and emotions. If scenes are disconnected, they need scripts to bring them together. And in neuroscience, you know, there's the studies of epileptic patients, the split brain and part of the brain being kind of this explainer, always looking for um, an explanation for everything, even if that explanation is not true. This is a story that just ran recently uh, by Melissa Faye Green. She's a literary journalist in the Atlantic. And it was about how we'll remember COVID after it's over, right? And um, she talked to Dan McAdams, who's a psychologist at Northwestern University, who talked about how we have this you know, tendency to fit our lives into these redemptive narrative arcs. And people who do that more actually have a higher psychological well-being, according to the studies. And, you know, she he brings up the point that if we are able to turn this ne negative experiences of COVID into this redemptive sequence, then we might be, you know, better off psychologically after the pandemic is done. Um, and then this story just came out in the upcoming issue of The Atlantic. Um, Clint Hill is a journalist, and he went to you know, different plantations and prisons talking to people about the history of slavery. And, and what he found is, you know, for so many of them, history isn't the story of what actually happened. It's the story of what they want to believe. It's not a public we all share, a public story that we all share, but an intimate one passed down like an heirloom that shapes the sense of who they are, which is ultimately a function of collective, a collective memory. And so I just think um, when I'm talking to students and thinking about stories and thinking about memory and research, um, I think it's important for us to challenge ourselves to flip that script, that script that we fit our lives into. Redemption narratives might be helpful in a psychological setting, but from a social justice perspective, if we're ever going to move the needle, I think that there really needs to be a rethinking of stories that merges neuroscience, psychology, history, and narrative form. Um, I think journalists and storytellers should understand how memory is susceptible to the redemption narratives and hero scripts and how we play such an important role in collective memory. 
and also be open to different forms, you know, braided and reported essays, alternative points of view, oral histories, and ultimately finding a way to excavate truths that might feel more palpable than it does, you know, comfortable, not just the story that we want to believe. So I will stop sharing. Hopefully I stayed in my time. Thank you very much, Erika. That was really wonderful and very much informative. Thank you very much. We will move now to Judith, who will speak about her research in relevance to collective memory. Judy? Yes, I need to just share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I will say that until this invitation, I hadn't really thought very much about how my research related to collective memory. So this has been a, a very interesting assignment uh, to think about whether there is a connection. Uh, and I will say from the start that I'm trained as a cognitive psychologist. Um, I use the tools of cognitive neuroscience uh, to understand language and bilingualism in particular. So I start with the observation that most people in the US speak English only. And what you have on this map is you have this gigantic blue map of the United States and the blue are all the places in the US where English is the language spoken. There are very few people in those locations speak a language other than English. In the red areas that are darker, uh, you have many more people. Uh, and of course you have an attitude in this country about speaking English only that makes it quite problematic to think about and to place the bilingualism in a context. Um, of those who speak a language other than English, about 80% are heritage speakers who learned that language at home. So what does that mean for collective memory? Well, for some, language is just a skill like other academic skills. You just learn something, it's completely uh, disembodied from any other experience in your life. For others, it's a culturally embedded experience that shapes uh, your collective memory and your identity. So in the last two decades, we've learned that learning and using uh, second language uh, shape the mind and the brain in some pretty extraordinary ways. And the question that I wanna ask very quickly tonight is how does this reflect collective experience? For individual learners, we can focus on how cognitive and neural resources are recruited to become proficient uh, speakers of a second language. If you learn a second language, your goal is to become a proficient speaker. But we can also ask about the social context of language. How is language socially embedded? Uh, and how does that experience shape bilingual brain networks? And I wanna start with an observation from our lab. I'm going to show you a set of experimental findings. I'm going to do it very, very quickly. This is going to be a sort of Sesame Street of neuroscience on bilingualism. Uh, and so I'm not gonna explain the methods in any detail. I'm happy to answer questions about them later. And I wanna first start by showing that even if you're living in one of those blue places in the US and you decide you're going to learn another language, learning that new language changes your brain almost instantly. And not only does it change your brain, but it changes your native language. This is an experiment that used, you have this person is wearing a cap, there's nothing invasive about it. This is measuring brain waves. And this is a study that was done with native English speakers learning Spanish, a sort of typical college classroom. And what we see, and again, I'm not gonna explain this in, in any gory detail. Well, what we see is that very quickly after about a semester of language study, the brain is beginning to register sensitivity not just for the second language, but the second language begins to affect your native language. So behavior isn't changed immediately, but your brain is beginning to process the second language in a way that infiltrates uh, the organization and structure of your uh, language system overall. So what happens now when bilinguals who are proficient and who acquire proficiency interact with one another? Well, bilingualism is embedded in diverse social and cultural contexts. Each of these experiences, I would like to argue, 
speculate, may contribute to collective memory. Bilinguals code switch with one another. Bilinguals switch between the two languages they use, and they do that quite fluently. Bilinguals live in contexts where there are social networks that differ. So some bilinguals live in contexts where everyone is similarly bilingual. Some bilinguals live in contexts where very few other people speak the same language as they do. And they may be required to make decisions on the fly about which of their languages they can speak. Some bilinguals and some language learners are immersed in a context where they're living in their native language. Others may be living in their second language context. Students who study abroad, uh, immigrants are living in a context where for the most part, they are living in a majority community where the language that's spoken is not their native language. And finally, there are, there are um, really, really quite dramatic differences in how linguistically diverse our environments are. So here in Southern California, we can, you can walk through campus when we're finally allowed to do that, and you will hear many, many languages spoken. There are other places, those blue areas of the United States, where you may only hear English. So I just want to illustrate very, very quickly how some of these things may, may work. Um, what happens when bilinguals code switch with one another? Well, bilinguals code switch, we also know that um, individuals who speak a dialect, so for example, African American English, um, code switch um, between the dialect form and the, uh, the majority uh, English standard standardized form. Um, and so we have code switching that occurs between two languages. And what the research shows is that bilinguals learn, I call it, tango with one another. Um, they can use subtle cues and speech to anticipate when language is going to switch. And if we look at their brain activity, what do we see? Well, if you are a habitual code switcher, the way you process language is different than an individual who is not. And moreover, it's social. The way individuals code switch and the way their brain activity reflects that depends on who's sitting in the room with you and whether that person is bilingual. The importance of a social network is important to identify who you talk to. Um, a number of researchers, as a former student of mine, uh, have developed measures to try to look at something they call language entropy. All it really means is that we can measure how many different languages do you speak with people during the course of your day? And how does that affect your brain activity? And what they find is that people with high entropy, people who are in contexts where there are a lot of different languages spoken and you're continually making choices about who you're gonna speak with, show particular patterns of brain activity um, that suggest that there is proactive control in the brain. What does that mean? It means that you're having to plan and make decisions about what's likely to be coming your way and that that is going to have consequences for you cognitively uh, and neurally in a more general way. Um, we see that language learning that occurs in social contexts is stronger, that social learning strengthens new learning in adult learners. And we see that language diversity itself, even just the ambient diversity of the environment has a dramatic effect. Uh, this is an example from a study that we recently published comparing a group of monolinguals who were living either in Pennsylvania, in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State is located right in the middle of a rather blue area of the country, and compared them to monolinguals in Southern California. Uh, uh, redder, not in the political sense, but in the diverse sense uh, area of the country. And the question was, what's the effect of being, if you only speak English, but you're living in a place where you hear all these languages or you hear only one language, what's, what's the consequence? And what we find in that study, and this was a study of teaching people a language they didn't, didn't know, what we find is that linguistic diversity benefits language learning. The monolinguals living in Southern California look very bilingual-like. Their monolingual brains in linguistically diverse places are taking in this social environment. So how do we bring this together? Context and diversity 
may benefit learning and may shape memory for life experience. Studies of biographical, autobiographical memory in bilinguals show that that autobiographical memory is linked to the language of experience. We remember things via the language experience we had at that time and in that context. Uh, there's a very beautiful book that was published uh, in 1989 by Ava Hoffman uh, about her experience, it's, it's called Lost in Translation, her experience of moving from Poland as a child to Canada and how she felt in this context that she lost herself, that, that her identity was lost uh, as her name was changed from Eva to Eva uh, in the uh, context of living in Canada. And so the point is that collective memory, uh, referring to this shared knowledge and shared uh, information in a social group, um, provides, I think, a critical new agenda for the neuroscience of uh, research on language and bilingualism, because it holds a promise to reveal the connections between the cognitive and social brain. It values the experience of all speakers of more than one language, and hopefully will overcome the bias here in the US associated with using English only. So we look forward to investigating these issues when the pandemic is over and the world is safe. And a very special thanks to my students and collaborators and to the uh, Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory for inviting our participation. Thank you. This is fantastic, Judy. Thank you very much. This is really amazing. So we move now to our last speaker, Mark. Mark, do you want to? Yes. Thank you. First of okay, all, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel so out of my league here with all these scientists. I'm just a, a historian, uh, a musician. But in fact, I don't think we could have a better moment to talk about the larger implications of collective memory, because the place I've worked on most of my adult life is Israel-Palestine. And right now, given the nightmare of violence that's going on there, it would be hard to exaggerate the importance of collective memory in fueling the conflict and fueling the attitudes of people both in the country on both sides and their respective communities outside the country and supporters. Um, it, in fact, every talk, uh, each of the three talks today uh, reflected a certain aspect of this conflict from, um, from Professor Gilbert's talk on just how how certain things can become agreed upon or challenge, get challenged when people uh, refuse to admit either remembering something or being present um, to the discussion from uh, Professor Hayasaki um, of, of just how memory, the conflicts of memory and how we understand the way memory gets determined from a journalistic standpoint, every, every single element has a kind of, uh, and, and Professor Kroll's uh, discussion here, I was thinking, well, that's exactly like bilingualism. You know, most, most Palestinians, for example, speak Hebrew. Uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel speak Hebrew fluently as more or less a native language. Some of them speak it better than they speak Arabic. In the, and they do that as citizens. In the, in the occupied territories, uh, there were generations that spoke it fairly well um, because they worked in Israel or in Israeli settlements. As the occupied territories got closed off, the newer generation arose that had much less Hebrew skills, and therefore they had much less one another example of or another reason why they had much less knowledge about Israeli society. So there was a disconnect between the two communities, reinforced both by closure, physical closure of the occupied territories from Israel, but also the lack of an ability of the occupied population to communicate. With, uh, with the occupying population in their own language. And, and then even today, I was just watching um, some shows, the other, uh, some new shows in Hebrew um, uh, in the last few nights where they had Palestinian citizens from mixed towns on talking in Hebrew uh, and being challenged about whether they were actually fully Israeli by the anchors, uh, even though they were speaking uh, perfect Hebrew. Um, but I do know also that for those speakers, because some of them are actually people I know, of course, when they are at home or on their own would never speak Hebrew, they would speak Arabic. So the, there's 
a really deep relationship between language and, and bilingualism. Of course, Israelis, the vast majority of Israelis speak English, um, Jewish Israelis. Uh, they might speak the language of, of a country they immigrated from if they immigrated from France or Russia or something. Uh, of course, they speak Hebrew, unless they're ultra-Orthodox. Some of them almost entirely speak Yiddish, and Hebrew is a second language to them. Um, but almost none of them, unless they're in the intelligence apparatus, speak Arabic. Uh, and while decades ago, uh, when there were a lot of immigrants, Jewish immigrants from Arab countries, or from Iran, or from Turkey, they spoke those Middle Eastern languages, or Kurdish as well, the, they, because they were downgraded and not considered valuable languages, their children generally lost that ability. So now you have many Israelis, Jewish Israelis who are ethnically quote unquote Middle Eastern or Arab or Kurdish or, um, but, but don't speak the, lang the heritage language. So they feel very torn and it gets represented also in their politics and their ability to have a collective memory. So, um, and, and even beyond that, um, you know, some of you may have heard that in these conflicts, as I said, many of them are taking place in so-called mixed towns, which are towns that at one point before 1948 were largely Palestinian towns with maybe some Jewish residents like Jaffa or Haifa or, um, or Akka or other towns. After 1948, when most of the Palestinians either fled or were pushed out or weren't allowed back, they became majority Jewish towns with significant Palestinian, um, Palestinian Arabs living there. And the collective memory of this town and what these towns were before 1948 <clears throat> is at the heart of how people understand the country today and their own place in it. So I have talked to many Israelis, for example, in Jaffa, in the town I, I did my research on the history of Jaffa and Tel Aviv. And many Israelis um, remember living in Jaffa uh, when they moved there after 1948. Many of them were either immigrants, poor immigrants from Romania or after the Holocaust, uh, Eastern Europe, or they were from the Arab world. So the, the small remnant of Palestinian citizens in Jaffa who still spoke Arab, Arabic, they developed fairly close relations with them because they were both, they were all to a certain extent outsiders from the dominant European Jewish identity in Israel after, after its creation. And the way the Jews who lived in these mixed neighborhoods remember this kind of in an idyllic way as having very close relations with the Palestinian neighbors, um, is rarely the way the Palestinians remember it looking back on it decades later. They saw these, they saw these Jews as people who came from outside, who you know, were living in the house their cousin lived in before they were pushed out during the war, or you know, not at all really attached. And their relationship to them is a relationship of one determined by having a very different balance of power, a different, very different position in the larger hierarchy of rights and of privileges and of recognition. So I have literally talked to people where one, where the, the Jewish Israeli will remember a very different past from his friend who's the Palestinian citizen. And of course, similar things go on between Israeli, Jewish Israelis and Palestinians from the West Bank who might've worked in Israel. And this is very similar to, of course, anyone who's ever looked at race relations in the US and how white people might understand relations with African-Americans. Oh, we all used to get along well, everyone was friendly to each other and not at all being aware of the incredibly disparate power relations right, involved. Whereas the African-Americans or Native Americans or others would have a very different story to tell. So I think what, what is really interesting to me and what I wish we could see a lot more of is the studying how the neurobiology of collective memory relates to the politics of collective memory. How does politics shape neurobiology and how does neurobiology shape politics? And are these seeming schemata in which no matter, like I said, it could be black and white Americans, it could be Israelis and Palestinians, it could be Chinese and 
and uh, Uyghur Muslims in China, you know, where you have hierarchies, um, is there a common sort of a patterns to differential collective memories in groups, mixed groups, um, or you know, when somehow when they have very different relations of power to the larger collective, or is it very culture specific and politics specific and history specific? Because really, until there can be a common collective memory, uh, which is a very very painful process, but until there's a uh, a common collective memory, it's almost possible to ever have a solution, which is why normally you need things, most of these conflicts when they end have things like truth, truth and reconciliation commissions or some kind of historical investigations to determine something approaching a recognized public account or memory of the history that produced the conflicts which are now finally being resolved. And um, most of the times when those happen, they're very political affairs, Everyone sort of knows the contours and it's just an official recognition. But what, what, what I've heard my colleagues talk about today makes me realize, you know, this is much, there's a lot of biology in this. There's a lot of cognitive psychology involved in this. And we need to do a much better job of being interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary and shaping each other's research agendas and shaping the epistemological grounding of the research we all do because I would research um, I would research collective memory very differently if I was in a research group with the, my colleagues on this panel than I ever would have if I wasn't. So it just shows why there needs to be a lot more uh, a lot more work across our campus and across every campus because I'm sure it's the same almost anywhere. I don't know I know very few historians in my area of the world in Africa and the Middle East who work regularly with uh, cognitive, uh, you know, um, neuro, neurobiologist or neuroscientist or cognitive psychologist, we tend to get lost in texts and and um, uh, and archives and things like that, and not understand the very material, physical component that relates to the the texts that we look at and the memories we we explore. So that's just very, you know, really got me thinking about how we can be doing something much more interesting than we've been doing, in, at least from our, my end as a historian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Did I would like to uh, comment on one of your um, uh, point. Uh, yes, I mean, we do better when we do interdisciplinary uh, research. And indeed, with you, with regard to your questions about neurobiology, so I will refer these questions to Erica. I, I have some questions for her about neurobiology because she uh, uh, writes in, in articles uh, analyzing other uh, research. But I will uh, tell you that indeed, if I'm not moderator now, I would have been one speaker who is speaking about my research on uh, collective trauma or intergenerational trauma. I do research, neurobiological research on trauma. So as I said, I mean, this, this should be really interdisciplinary uh, research. I mean, exactly now I'm, I'm, we were hearing from you and free, uh, from the, the three other speakers. It's that, that's really wonderful. And you can, we can see uh, from different angles how like you are uh, dealing with the same uh, topics. And indeed that's the purpose of uh, this uh, dialogue. Hmm. So now we move to the second part of our discussion. And I know, Mark, you might leave uh, anytime on uh, your phone, but that's why I want to start with uh, asking you some questions. And so you are historian. And uh, Erika said, it's like, so writing history might sometimes, I mean, we, we might use the narratives from people, from interviews. Really, what's the difference between history uh, of a social group and the collective memory of this social group? And how much we can rely on collective memory in documenting uh, history, knowing from Dr. Uh, Loftus that there are individual false memories, but uh, I agree with Erica, there might be also 
uh, false collective memories or there is a malleability of collective memory. So how much really you can as historian rely on, on collective memory in, in documenting history? But that's, you know, that's a really scary question. Um, first of all, I'd say, you know, collective trauma and memory, what you're doing is absolutely crucial to any societies that whether it's, you know, uh, Jewish society, of course, suffering uh, centuries of anti-Semitism and then the Holocaust, Palestinian society, uh, the Uyghurs, you know, Rohingya, any, any group that has suffered collective trauma that's going to profoundly shape their memory. You know, as you were saying, and I'm thinking, well, right now in this country, we can't even get a collective memory about what happened on January 6th. We have half of America, which has one collective memory, half of America, which has a completely other one. We can say, presumably everyone on this panel, that we know the facts, however we want to get in, uh, define those. More or less, the overwhelming facts represent a certain narrative, which is how most Democrats and Liz Cheney remember uh, what happened. And But for other people, the facts simply don't matter. And a collective memory is being a forge that you can imagine is being taught to young children already and that is going to become their their understanding of these events because they're too young to have processed it in an adult manner for generations right just just like the way the south law you know the lost cause of the south it was a noble cause generations of white americans have grown up with that even though we know objectively from the standards of history or journalism that's simply not true so i think we have so many examples already that collective memory is a narrative. And it's a narrative that tells us something very important about a society and a group, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what happened. It tells us how a certain contemporary identity, because it, if it's a collective memory, we are still, we are bothering to look at. It's because however old it is, it's still relevant today. For example, like uh, Bosnian Serbs, remembering the, the conquest at the hands of the Ottomans, um, that you know, hundreds, almost half a millennium later, was at the core of the anger that led to a genocide. Right? Um, was a was a was a memory, a collective memory of their mistreatment by Ottoman Turks, which simply doesn't have a a, a bearing in historical reality. But it doesn't matter. It's still very relevant. So I think what we need to do is understand that memory is not the same as history, but memory shapes history in very profound ways. And um, what's even more interesting is I'm also a journalist. I, and I work a lot in the Middle East as a journalist in Africa. And especially the last 10 years with the Arab uprisings and such, I've had a chance to be seeing history as it's unfolded and reporting on it as a journalist while also thinking about it as a historian and trying to give a long durée perspective as I'm writing, a, let's say a journalistic report from the field. And um, I think, it, you know, it, it's sort of like seeing the only way I can describe it is like if anyone knows anything about photography, it's like what kind of aperture are you having? You know, are you are you having the aperture very close so that only, you know, so that only one thing is in focus or do you have it wide open so that the whole field is in focus, but you might lose the clarity of the moment. And I think that's why it's so important that there's a multiplicity of accounts and a multiplicity of histories using the same texts, the same events, going through the same collective identities and memories, the, and each one using a different lens or a different focal point or a different filter, uh, just like um, you know, astronomers or, or brain imagers, I suppose, take many, many different images with many different filters and, and foci, and then create a composite that they think best represents the whole. That's, I think, what historians do and I think that's also why some of the best journalism I've seen as the sort of first draft of history of the last 10 years, for example, in the Arab world, the nightmare in Syria or Yemen is kind of collective, our collective projects where you have multiple people who are deeply rooted, almost like a neural network coming together to share all these events and their experiences and hoping in so doing, they're creating a living archive that then can can give a much broader historical perspective down the line. Thank you very much, Mark. That's really very helpful. And from there, that brings me to a question to Margaret. Uh, so Margaret, the, the, the memory structure 
so there are like those two theories, like uh, bottom up or top down. So is it true that like individual cognitive mechanisms underlie the formation of shared knowledge and collective memory or these like top down? What do you think? So like, like cultures shape and influence individuals' cognitive structures. So, or is it like reciprocal? And where is the power? Which one? And well, does it sometimes like be top down? Other in other occasions, in other uh, social groups, it is bottom up. What are the factors that really determine which one is really? I mean, the, the way that uh, collective memory is structured. Yeah, I think that's. So those are obviously very good questions. Um, I mean, in some ways, the, the kind of collective memory or the account of collective memory I develop, which may not be shared by others, um, you know, it's all in terms of individual people doing things with other people and fixing on a certain understanding of things and then going on from there. Um, I mean, how much that relates to individual memory processes and brain processes is about as far from my own expertise as it could be. But clearly, <laughs> say but quickly, but clearly, you know, there are human processes, human brain processes involved at every stage of the way. Um, but I think the collective situation is, is sort of a sort of rather special thing. I mean, it's something that it, it exists at a, at, a, at a collective level um, with all the people contributing to it uh, who are involved with their brains. Um, but, um, you know, maybe it's a somewhat different kind of thing. I mean, maybe it's not even, that's not even a speculation. I mean, it's a state of affairs that's sustained by a bunch of different people. And I think it might be reasonable to call it collective memory, the thing I was talking about, but, you know, how it relates to individual brains has got to be a complex story that I couldn't possibly begin to tell. So I, I would like to, to follow up with one question. So you, you, you spoke about the, the stability of collective memory. I mean, the, really, how much is really uh, collective memory stable or is it fragile or is dynamic? How, how do you see, I mean, is it okay? So like we speak about uh, decades or, or a century of collective memory, how much is really uh, collective memory stable or dynamic? Well, again, that's, a very, good, that's a very good question. I mean, that, you know, again, one can't answer these things too quickly because I think in some ways, I mean, my account of collective memory was basically creative for your, for your meeting. And there's also the question of collective belief, but it's all about people interacting with their different motives and so on. And um, I did say, I think they had, a, given my account of it, it has a certain stability because people feel kind of stuck into it. Like they feel stuck into a collective belief. They know that if they speak against it, just they say sort of, oh, you know, it's all rubbish to say this. If this is a collective belief, people are going to pounce on them and re rebuke them and make demands. So there's going to be some, someone has to be kind of rather brave perhaps to try to break break the uh, agreement as it were and had to speak out and i said like in the case of collect of, in of collective belief but this would apply to collective memory which is very similar on my my model if you want to call it um that someone could perhaps say look personally i really don't remember it that way that would be a way to sort of break it up a little bit and then others say oh you know we're quite wrong but then if people you know begin to speak about it they can say i don't remember it because they could bring a photo and say look i mean this is what we see now don't we i mean there's a report i think erica gave that you know there's a report from one person this is what happened then a whole bunch of other people may get on board and they go hey that's what happened so we might say you know we we remember that's what happened. We heard all about it, we discussed it. And then someone says, no, wait a minute, but here's a photo that was taken at the time. Here's a, here's a, a, um, a movie that was taken at the time. See, <laughs> it's wrong. So, you know, these things can be destabilized in different ways. And I think it's a matter of, you know, anyone's common sense or, or experience. You know, how can one break through established positions where people are inclined to be poo-pooed if they, speak against them.
well, you know, the brave person speaking up, maybe the, the you know, the um, uh, impulsive person speaking against it, when perhaps they again get, you know, pushed down. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, lots of ways. So there are ways to break these things up, I'm sure. Um, there obviously are, but they have a certain inherent stability. So that's what I was going to say. People feel, you know, it, it, it's, you know, if, if people use this phrase political correctness, which is sort of not politically correct to mention in some places, but you know, the idea being, you know, you're not supposed to say certain things and whichever side you're on as with respect to what the things are, then, you know, you're going to be in real trouble if you say them, whatever they are and whatever group it is. Um, so, you know, there, there's this sort of pressure on people, I think, that my accounts capture. Um, incidentally, in terms of what other people know about, I mean, I was inspired by De Emil Durkheim's sociology, where he talks about the collective beliefs uh, sort of feelings and ways of acting, which are sort of independent of those of the individual in the individuals. So you can sort of think of it as a separate level of existence. We sort of create these collective things and we kind of, um, we're somewhat bound by them, but then I'm just saying myself, but we can sort of break through them, but they're, they're forces to be reckoned with. And that's one of the things I guess Durkheim emphasized. Thank you very much. I mean, that, that was really uh, helpful. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to to move to uh, Erica. Uh, I know, like you, you wrote very fantastic um, articles uh, analyzing uh, research and neurobiology of um, inherited uh, memory, and indeed, I mean, you raised uh, the questions on whether even certain epigenetic memories of slavery or genocide poverty or abuse could be inherited. So can you elaborate on, on this? Yeah, um, I first I wanted to circle back really quickly to a couple of the points made because um, I was thinking about the top down bottom up uh, thinking around memory. And just, you know, I have children, small children, preschoolers. Um, they are already if you add in fact just last night i asked one of them to tell me a story and they already fit it into a narrative frame a coyote got mommy Mo i hit the coyote i saved mommy there are there's been studies around preschoolers already fitting um, stories into these narrative frameworks and so i think that there's sure that could be an exposure to too many like superhero cartoons but also we know from um, neuroscience that there's, you know, these different parts of the brain that crave these story forms and, you know, we are always um, even deleting information or adding to add into the story form that we, that we seek um, and that we, and that we in. Um, also around the question of like how strong or fragile is collective memory. I think about that from a literary journalism perspective. I think of um, the book Hiroshima, which all of our students read in our program. And you know, when John Hersey went to report this story from the ground, from the survivors of the atomic bomb, you know, that presented a very different picture of what the destruction was after the bomb that Americans had not been exposed to in that kind of way. And so actually, you know, there is evidence that collective memories can shift over time. And certainly if you there's been studies of people who interview, you know, World War II veterans, people who were older, who've lived in that time and maybe, you know, support still might express support for the bomb, right? But then younger generations, their collective memory changes and, and, and maybe expresses more um, negative feelings around uh, the bomb too. And then just the last thing, Mark mentioned politics shaping neurobiology and how does neurobiology shape politics? Um, and I, you know, there's also been research around like media coverage of World War II on um, French television and scientists recording brain activity using um, fMRI technology. Um, and you know this they found that collective memory, which exists outside of individuals as we've been talking about, shapes the organization of individual memories in the prefrontal medial prefrontal cortex, which is this area that's really important for social cognition and memory. And so I just wanted to bring up a couple of those points. And you know I look I'm looking at epigenetics, I'm writing, um, a book around twins and thinking about what in different ways. One of the things was out um, as you mentioned trauma and can it be passed on um, through the generations? And then 
Erica, you you froze. Can you hear me? No. Oh, yes. Can you hear me now? I'm so sorry. My internet connection is terrible. Um, yeah. So so there's been research about you know epigenetic imprints of trauma. Um, you know, being passed on, for example, in cases of Holocaust survivors and famine victims, um, this inherited trauma. Some of these studies are largely disputed and very controversial, so I just wanted to bring that up. But there are studies that, like, for example, have looked at epigenetic marks in mice um, and have found that some of these epigenetic marks, which are um, the marks that, you know, essentially flip on or off genes, right? So flip on or off traits. And the, um, the research around epigenetic um, epigenetics thinks about environmental impacts on these marks, right? And so there has been some research around mice and um, epigenetic markers that could be passed on um, to future generations um, and, and, and also around plants and worms. Um, but you know, I think a lot of this research uh, when it comes to humans is still, and maybe, you know, I'm not the scientist, I just read the science and try to um, make it readable for an audience. But uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, there's been a lot of um, still, it's very early in the early stages of how how this process actually works and if it's working and how, it, you know, if in humans are these, you know, memories actually passed on. Um, and I can talk more about that, but I don't want to take too much time. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Erica. Yeah, I agree. Indeed, like even in uh, my research in the lab, we, we found even biomarkers for uh, uh, transgenerational uh, transmission of trauma. Yeah, so, but yeah, of course, that's in animals and mice. We don't know in humans. Yeah. Uh, but indeed, I, I can tell you that in, you know, in, in a human, there are some studies. I have collaborator in Rwanda, and everyone uh, remember the Rwanda genocide that Tutsi and Roto. And my collaborator studied the uh, offspring, the children of widows who witnessed the war and who witnessed the, the uh, killing of their husbands. And although the, the children didn't witness, they were just like, uh, I mean, their mothers were pregnant in them. And my collaborator found that uh, those children who are now in their 20th, 25 years old, so they have higher rates of depression and PTSD, and there are some epigenetic markers, yes, that, that are really changed in those children, knowing that they didn't witness that the genocide or the war, yeah. So at least now we, we have some, uh, unfortunately, natural experiment that, that proves that, yes, there is uh, intergenerational or transgenerational transmission of trauma. So my, my question now to, to you, uh, Judith, I mean, uh, so the language, our memories are made up of, of the stories that we believe about our past, about how we got here and who we are. So story are, or are requiring language. Yeah, and so you are uh, researching the, the bilingual uh, people and then what's the role of language dominance in collective memory and particularly in collective memory malleability? How easy is then to, to have malleable collective memory being uh, the, with the uh, dominant language? So I think that there, I think the evidence suggests that this is a very dynamic process. And there are two things to say, I think, in response to this question. One is that even within the same people and even within the same people living in the same context, there may be moments of change where the relationship between what, how they're using the two languages change and who they speak with and what information they're, they're taking in and how that affects their collective experience may, may change. Um, having said that, I think that there is a critical point about what it means to have a language that I think in some of the comments that Mark made where you have 
um, you've, you have languages where, uh, especially if you have a home language and that home language is not the community language, that the way you relate to the larger culture is going to be affected by your identity with that home language and how, how you navigate that. And what I think is exciting about the recent neuroscience is that it suggests that our brains are very sensitive to those processes. It also suggests that individuals who maintain the home language, so it's not a matter of, I think there was a comment in the chat, there's not a, not a, it's not a matter of, of saying that some people don't need to speak English in the US. It's a matter of saying that we need to embrace the diversity of languages and support the idea that home languages should not be relinquished for the convenience of society. Um, and, and what we see is that we see many children who are raised with a language at home, they then go to school and in school, they are essentially forced to relinquish the home language. And both from a scientific point of view, uh, the, that is a very stupid thing to do because the home language is their strong language. It's the language that they're going to be able to develop uh, cognitively, socially, emotionally in. Um, but it's also that it's asking them to, it's this, this last example I gave of Ava Hoffman, it's, it's basically saying, give up your identity and, and that experience. And so the, if, if, we can, um, if we can embrace the idea that we don't give anything up and that in fact, it's, a not, it's not a, a zero sum game here. It's not, it's not a limited resource. Humans are capable of using, learning and using many languages, of, of navigating many cultures, of maintaining identities that may vary depending upon the context in which they're interacting. And I think part of it is that we have this, that we have this pressure to think that we need to simplify things uh, and, and to, to turn them into a single, a, a, a single template that will work for all contexts. And I think all of this suggests that that's just not, not the case. Thank you very much, Judith. Indeed, I have so many other questions, but I feel, I mean, with the time, uh, I mean, I want to leave some time for Mike and the audience. So Mike, you have the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Amal. And, and we'll take some audience questions in a second. I just have uh, something that I wanted to bring up with um, uh, this illustrious panel here. And it really does have to go back to this link between the neuroscience of, of, of collective memory and that shared narrative in that story, the idea that the brain is naturally wired to process stories and, and those sequences of events. And, and I think that there's a survival and evolution story behind that. So this is, from, from the neuroscientific perspective, the, the brain is truly wired to process event sequences. And, and you know, a, a certain thing A leads to B leads to C because that allows us to predict the future. In fact, the, the, the kind of the joke in the memory world is that memory is not about the past at all, although of course this discussion is entirely about remembering the past, but it's not why it evolved. It evolved to allow us to predict the future with some degree of success and be able to anticipate what the outcomes of certain actions are going to be so we can promote our own survival. So with that logic in mind, the notion of a story is really appealing because now you have a, a beginning and an end, uh, something that causes something, and understanding those sequences helps promote our survival. But of course, as humans, you can imagine that the, the side effect of that is we are filled with histories and rich stories and narratives, some of which may be true, although if you're, if you're you know, looking at work from Beth Loftus and others, you recognize that actually the majority of it turns out not to be true, it turns out to be sort of reconstructions that are uh, somewhat fictitious and somewhat maybe based on a loose version of reality. So, so I, I really like what uh, uh, Professor Hayasaki said earlier about this notion that the brain is kind of wired for this, this type of processing. And I think from a neuroscience perspective, definitely a lot of evidence to suggest that. I guess one question that I had, and, and it may be a little bit circular, we talked about collective memory and, and history and collective beliefs. And I'm trying to understand where the chicken and the egg problem here is. 
In other words, in order to have beliefs that really motivate maybe a population to think a certain way, you have to have some record of shared memory, some record of experience that is communicated and shared, and maybe language plays into that, that allow for that belief to manifest. And, and I, I tend to think also from the psychological perspective of cognitive dissonance. We always want to reduce that as much as possible. So things that don't fit with that narrative, we tend to exclude. Once we have a belief in place, everything else that we recall tends to conform to that belief. So, so I'm trying to figure out what leads to what. Do we start with sort of a shared collective memory that then evolves into a belief? Or is the collective belief what allows us to kind of create shared memories? I guess that's to anyone <laughs> on the panel. It's kind of a general question. I mean, one, one conceptual question is what is memory? And I, I myself avoided that by saying that in the collective case, we are, we're jointly committed to, we arrive at a, a memory that we, that, it, that we, we sort of stipulate is our memory. We agree is, is our memory, but I, I left that unanalyzed. And I just, all I know about the concepts is, as I say, some of my colleagues say, to remember does not involve believing. So they're separate phenomena. To believe that it happened and to remember that it happened are different. Um, so all I was saying was that one can give accounts of collective belief on the one hand and collective memory on the other that are different, but that leaves open the relationship of any sort of history or you know, what comes first, the sort of chicken and egg problem. Um, so yeah, and it's all grounded in human f faculties. All this is grounded in basic human faculties. So you might be better off, you know, you might be the one who can say, well, what comes first, memory or belief, if that is a question. I, I think I, I would just like to say, I think in, in highly ideological societies or communities where there's significant conflict, um, how I wonder how hard it is to remember something you're not supposed to remember. Um, <laughs> if you're if you're a white person in the South in the 50s and you and you witness the mistreatment or violence against a person of color, or even go back further against an indigenous American during you know the period of of the genocide and displacement, um, but it's not something that you're supposed to remember. Um, uh, how, how do you remember it still? I know stories about uh, the Holocaust. So many, you know, you always hear the, um, people talking in Europe, like the Jews were just gone. Like what happened to them? I mean, how did they not know what happened to them? But somehow they're gone. Yet in Israel, a very similar thing. Jews remember like, where did the Arabs go? They were here one day, they were gone the next day. And and that's what they remember. They remember like they like they like they zipped out or they popped out of existence, like a, like a subatomic, you know, particle or something like a, um, or, or a photon or something, you know, but in fact, of course, there's a huge process that goes on between them being there and them not being there. And so in that sense, their memory must be inseparable from a whole system of codes that are embedded in their brain and their executive function about what they're allowed to and should process in their mind, right? Versus what should be not remembered, right? I, I wonder, but I, I can't even imagine how, how we would go about figuring that out, ex except that we'd have to do it together. It's something that would involve all, a whole bunch of disciplines looking at the question. You know, this prompts uh, kind of a similar question to something that was asked earlier, and I think there's a, a related question to it in the chat right now from Nicolas. Um, so this is a question, um, I think for, for uh, Mark and Erica, you, you would be best uh, able to address this. And the question I'm going to paraphrase is really about the role of the media. And and the question, which I think is, is kind of a, a brilliant thing to ask, right? Is it too naive to consider an initiative to have some media source, a newspaper or something, to have to be the ultimate arbiter of truth, right? To have that um, reconciled version of the truth and be trustworthy by all. I mean, is that something that you even think is doable uh, at some point in the future? <laughs> so to to expect the media to be the arbiter of truth. Um, or at least one medium, like one sort of gold standard newspaper. 
I mean, I would say the BBC usually does a good job, but uh, that's just my opinion. Um, but something like that, right? It's a, to have some some source that would be trustworthy by all, right? No agenda, no politics, just pure historical record. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question. <laughs> I, I, I think that it's hard for, well, here's what I think. I think a lot of people have their collective memories um, that are shaped by their beliefs. And so they bring those collective memories and then read the news, however you might see it, and interpret it according to their collective memories. So as we have been talking about, we're a country, a society that's incredibly divided in how we have, hold collective memories, right? About history, about moments happening right now. Um, so can these sides agree? Is there some sort of publication that would include all of these different perspectives? Um, I think that's uh, really, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that one publication. I think the shifting of the perspective of who you're telling the story from, which is I think something that, you know, Mark talked about earlier, right? Um, when you shift the lens, you talked about a camera, right? When you shift the lens and tell the story through multiple uh, points of view, you're getting these different um, perspectives and experiences and collectively that brings together maybe a more accurate picture of a true story, right? And um, as a journalist, you know, I think about that a lot as I'm interviewing one person and somebody else's mm -hmm. interpretation of that experience might com be completely different. And so if you can include those two experiences, their truths, even if they don't match up, then maybe you have a more accurate picture. But unfortunately, with a lot of journalism, I mean, it's rush, 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 get the story like we see the first draft. Um, and so, you know, long form obviously allows us to do more in-depth um, storytelling that's multidimensional in perspective. And I think that's important, but it does, it's, it's really hard to pull off um, at a daily kind of place, a place of covering the news on a daily basis, like um, covering what's happening, you know, yeah. in the week. Yeah, it's hard to imagine an incentive structure that would that would promote that, right? Um, to to have kind of a a singular version. But I think what you said and what Mark mentioned earlier with sort of apertures and thinking about different views on reality, um, that makes a lot of sense. But then the onus is still on the person, yeah. right? Uh, to figure out what they're gonna what's gonna resonate with them, what's gonna cause the least amount of cognitive dissonance based on their beliefs. Right. You know? But isn't the problem that people? We need more. Co we need people to have more cognitive dissonance and recognize what that 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 cognitive dissonance means. They need to broaden their perspective. And you know, it used to be the New York Times and Walter Cronkite, right? Those were the sort. Well, I'm older uh, than not everyone, but I'm I'm old enough to remember Walter Cronkite as like you know the gold standard. Then it was Peter Jennings, who was the you know, and the and you trusted them, right? I don't think anyone trusts anyone the way. In my youth, people still trusted the great TV anchors of the three major networks or the New York Times. But it turns out, of course, that that, that um, the Times, Cronkite, any of these sources had their own biases. They were they they still were within a mainstream, a much more homogeneous mainstream view of, of America and what it was that people wouldn't um, that people didn't know to even bother challenging it, except people on you know the more far ends of the spectrum. So I think it's impossible, and I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. What I think people need to have, I think the crucial thing is actually having respect for and uh, both journalistic integrity, the integrity of journalists and of academics, the two key things, because we are the arbiters of, for lack of a better word, of truth or what counts as truth in any Give a moment, and when you have people like Trump or others talking the fake news and you know all these insults, to try to legitimate us, delegitimate uh, academics and journalists, and it's huge. I mean, you have these attacks on on critical race theory, which just makes up a, a, something that has nothing to do with critical race theory, but then outlaws all these courses, and we can go on and on. Or lack of funding for for science involving stem cells and so many things. Um, this is all from, some, from people who really don't care what's actually accurate. They just care that what they believe is the proper ideology to govern life is the one that is in power. And so the fidelity to truth, and I guess I would just ask my fellow panelists, because this is what confuses me. You know, people actually say that people really believe that Trump 
that the election was stolen from Trump. I actually think no one believes that. I think people know very well what happened, but they just want to have a white nationalist country where white Christians are still in charge and they and they understand they can't say that. So they have a narrative that they can say that allows them to talk to at least claim something else is the problem. But everyone, no one. I don't I don't buy the fact that, you know, 80 percent of Republicans think the election was stolen. I think 80 percent of Republicans wish that it was the 1950s. Uh, and and this is the narrative that allows them to push that forward and restrict voting rights and do all kinds of things. So maybe they can get back to that again. And so then it's a question of what if collective memory is a lie that everyone knows is a lie, but it's pushed anyway because it's politically expedient. And but no one can say it because in the act of saying it, you're admitting that everything is actually about ideology, not about searching for the, the truth. And that's where I think also we get this mix of politics and ideology and science. Response from anyone? I was just thinking that, you know, I, we talk about journalists, but I mean, as uh, Mark said, there's also like historians or, you know, academics. There are people called historians. They tend to use uh, documents and, and uh, uh, perhaps monuments and inscriptions and artifacts. There's an awful lot of stuff that we can look at that gives good evidence of history. But, I, you know, so those things are also terribly important and they're relevant to collective memory, too. Um, but there is a sort of modern thing, which I guess we're all aware of now, which is kind of terrible and scary. I have no idea how to do with it. The photos can be, uh, you know, photoshopped. Mm. So that, you know, the idea that, well, I took a photo of it. You know, here it is. Here's a picture of Churchill walking down in such and such a way. Well, you know, I don't know if we can rely on photographic uh, evidence now, but there was a time when I guess we probably could. And so one question is, how can we get good records? How can we get things? Our brains aren't good enough because they don't last that long. But if we want records for, for posterity, uh, how are we to do that? I mean, that would be a sort of repository, if not of collective memory, of data uh, that can correct collective memory um, or help to provide true ones. So I just thought that we haven't mentioned artifacts really in those kinds of things. And I think we need to do that if we're talking about this sort of issue. So I, I think you bring up an excellent uh, point. I mean, I think right now we probably still have the sufficient technology to be able to tell when pictures are doctored, when when videos are, you know, uh, uh, um, people are using, um, uh, you know, deep learning to, to encode videos that make it look like someone who's not the person you would expect be doing something that they're not. But but eventually technology is going to catch up and make it almost impossible for us to be able to detect those differences. So uh, we're heading down a <laughs> very tricky path if you kind of extrapolate into the future. Uh, Mark comments in the, in the chat, it might be more likely to get the truth at a local bar and more fun. I totally agree. Um, and I almost think that's a, a great way to kind of um, sum up our discussion here to say, we're not gonna we're not gonna get to the root of the truth today, but um, um, you can always find at least a fun version of it at a local bar. So Amal. Yeah, it is eight, and it was really amazing. I mean, it it was just like mind blowing. It was brain provoking. Thank you very much, our panelists. I know. I mean, I I would. I mean, ask you maybe fifty questions. Maybe we could just like stay three or four hours. Hopefully one day we do that again in person in campus, hopefully next year with longer time for every one of you. And thank you very much. Thank you our audience for being with us. And Mike, do you want? Yeah, thank you, Amal. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our audience. And uh, we will see you again next time. Take care and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank okay. you.